Hey guys, it's Poe back again with Let's Get Techy. Today, I have a lot of new things. I've got a new haircut, freshly trimmed beard. Thank you to my wife, of course. Uh, also got a new camera and a new lens that you are seeing me through. So about two or so years ago, I upgraded my camera from the Nikon D3300 that I was using to shoot 1080p and moved to a Panasonic Lumix G7. And that was when I switched over to 4K recording. And here recently I decided to change the camera again as well as the main lens that I use for recording video. And um, it's not technically an upgrade as this camera was, it's very similar to the Lumix G7. Uh, it's the Lumix G85. Uh, the biggest difference uh, other than some uh, differences in how it how it feels to hold. The grip is a little bit bigger. The door for the memory card is in a better spot. Uh, but other than those, uh, the biggest difference is actually in-body image stabilization, which is fantastic for shooting anything handheld with it. Um, so I did uh, get some handheld shots for this video that you're watching now. Um, also upgraded my lens to the holy grail of tech YouTuber lenses uh, and it is the Sigma 18 to 35 which is a Canon EF mount uh, and I've obviously used an adapter to uh, use it with this Panasonic uh, Micro Four Thirds camera. Um, but today we are doing another build. This is going to be a budget streaming build. Uh, it's right in the territory of $500 to $550. Uh, we did source used parts for this as that is going to, without a doubt, give us the best value. Um, so the, the games that the individual wanted to play and stream for this, uh, for this setup was Counter-Strike Global Offensive, which we all know is not super uh, demanding on hardware by any means, uh, and Fortnite. Um, Again, not super demanding, so we got lucky with both of those. Um, but we did need a decently powerful CPU so that we could handle the gaming load at the same time as streaming. Um, so put together a list, uh, sent it over to him. He said, heck yeah, let's do it. And as I was getting the hardware, I made a few tweaks to that list. Uh, we initially were going to use a Ryzen 1600. Uh, ended up being able to source a 1700 for less than what I was going to pay for the 1600. Uh, we also went with a Radeon RX 580 8GB for this. More than enough graphical horsepower for those two games that he is planning on streaming uh, with some headroom uh, if he wants to try some AAA gaming as well. Uh, so without further ado, let's go ahead and jump right into the build. So for this build, uh, I was lucky in that he did not give me any restrictions as far as the size, um, but we did still go with something reasonable. Uh, this is a mid tower from Deep Cool. It is the Matrix 55 Add RGB, which is a funny name, but it just stands for addressable RGB and does have an addressable RGB strip uh, down the front of the case. Uh, it does also include a glass front panel as well as a glass side panel. Uh, now those eagle-eyed viewers of you will notice that this is the B450 Strix board out of the demolished computer from our last video. Uh, and I was able to snag that for uh, significantly less than you would expect due to its sordid history. Uh, but I got it cleaned up um, and it works absolutely fantastic. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we did go with a Ryzen 1700 in this build uh, for its 8-core, 16-thread uh, capabilities. Also, a 16GB kit of ADATA 3000MHz RAM. Now, this was the one part that I did not love about the case. It's the design of the rear I.O. shields, uh, and unfortunately, it does have the breakouts uh, rather than unscrewing and just removing them and putting them back in, uh, you do have to break them out. And once they're out, they're out. Uh, there's no putting them back in. Uh, luckily, they do give you the screw holes. So if you wanted to replace them, you could get some I.O. covers uh, and just replace those. 
This case was actually really nice for the price. Uh, we ended up paying $50 for it uh, and it has plenty of room. It will fit EA TX motherboards as well. Uh, and as you can see with us installing our RX 580, uh, plenty of room for graphics cards as well, both in length and width. Uh, that's something that a lot of people do forget when they're uh, going for a new case is how wide that graphics card is going to stick out. Uh, we did go with a Seasonic uh, 650 watt Focus Plus Gold modular power supply for this build. Uh, and Seasonic does have some of the best built uh, power supplies. Uh, additionally, I didn't know if he was going to have Ethernet available where he was planning on using this computer, so we did pop in a very inexpensive uh, 300 megabit per second uh, wireless card. Uh, for storage, we initially uh, were going to use this Samsung 500 gigabyte hard drive. At the time of installing it, we thought it was a 250 gigabyte SSD, and then after booting the computer up, we realized holy moly, this is a 500 gig drive. Uh, he did not need 500 gigs of fast storage, uh, so we actually traded it for this Intel 250 gig uh, SATA M.2 drive uh, and used the money that we got on top of that trade to swap out the uh, cheaper case fans that I had previously installed uh, for some much nicer addressable RGB fans. Uh, and there's tons of RGB fans out on the market, tons of addressable RGB fans. Uh, while I wanted to keep the budget low, I also wanted to get something from a known manufacturer. And I have used Nwins fans before, and these worked out fantastic. Uh, they look good. They seem to move a decent amount of air. Uh, they are, again, addressable RGB. So uh, using those with this computer, allowed us to control the lighting with the button on top of the case. So now that button controls not only the addressable RGB strip across the front of the case, uh, but it also does control all of the RGB fans. And for this build, we did decide to go with Windows 10 Professional, although not because the end user needed the uh, extra things that come along with the professional. Uh, it was actually just because I have some extra Windows 10 professional keys laying around. Uh, so I figured I would donate that to the build and save a little bit of cost for him. Uh, but without further ado, I'll shut up and we'll get to the best part, the sexy B-roll. And now we move on to testing. So for testing, we did test one of the two games that uh, the new computer's owner is planning on playing and streaming, uh, which is good old Counter-Strike Global Offensive. And no, this isn't a very hard game to uh, play. It's not very demanding on the hardware, um, but uh, nevertheless, this is what he plans on playing. So. Figured I'd test this. Um, the other game that he was planning on playing is Fortnite, and I just personally don't care for that game, um, so we're not going to be testing that one. Uh, so for this test, uh, we did run settings at 1080p with the uh, highest graphics uh, enabled. Um, for this first round of testing, 
um, we did use GPU encoding. Uh, so when you're streaming, you have the option of using your video card to encode or your CPU to encode. And for this first one, uh, we tried the GPU. Now, I wouldn't plan on using the GPU. I personally don't like using the GPU uh, for the encoding when streaming or recording. Uh, but that's just my personal preference. There's plenty of people who use uh, the, their video card to record or stream. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that at all. It's just, just personal preference. And I prefer to uh, have my CPU rather than my GPU doing the work when I'm gaming uh, and streaming. So uh, for this first test, we did GPU encoding. And uh, it went fairly well. I think the video probably portrays it just a bit better uh, than what it actually was. Um, so for the majority of time it was smooth gameplay. We had frame rates that were well in excess of 100 at I think all times. Uh, the problem that I had was a little hiccup here and there every, we'll say every minute or so, um, where it would just micro stutter. Just one quick micro stutter um, then it would go back to you know encoding and playing perfectly fine um, but that's one of the things that you know you can have happen if you are using your GPU for encoding rather than your CPU um, I did pull up a hardware monitor while using it uh, just to check usage uh, it was utilizing the GPU fully to encode uh, which is good, that's exactly what you want to see if you're using the GPU to encode. Um, but again, did have those uh, small hiccups here and there, unfortunately. And moving right along, our next test was same game, uh, but with CPU encoding rather than GPU encoding. And again, I can't explain why I personally favor this, uh, but it is personal preference. Um, I don't know if I like the fact of keeping my uh, graphics horsepower freed up to play the actual game or if I just uh, favor the CPU horsepower over GPU. Uh, part of me thinks that it's probably the latter. Uh, but either way, um, here we can see testing with CPU encoding and again, much the same with frame rates in game. Uh, well above 100 FPS at all times, which is exactly what you would want for a game like this uh, competitive esports title. Um, and again, uh, perfectly acceptable from the viewer side. Um, GPU was also perfectly acceptable from the viewer side, but unfortunately did have those minor hiccups on the game side. And with CPU encoding, we did not see those same micro stutter issues. Um, I believe overall we may have had a little less frame rate um, in game with CPU encoding versus GPU, uh, which is kind of a bit odd if you think about it. Um, we're taking uh, more demand off of the graphics card and putting it onto the CPU, so you would think freeing up the graphics card would give you more uh, frame rate in game, uh, but that's not necessarily the case uh, if the CPU is uh, not drawing frames quick enough. Uh, the GPU will send over what's called a draw call and it has to wait on the CPU to tell it what it needs to do or what it needs to draw on screen. Uh, but nevertheless, we did un end up with slightly less frame rate uh, with CPU encoding, but a much smoother experience uh, game side and again, a very acceptable uh, experience viewer side. And finally, we move on to some temperature testing. And just to be quite frank, we did not bother wasting the time to test our GPU temperature. Um, it is, as you know, an MSI Gaming X card, and the cooler that comes on it is more than adequate for the Polaris GPU that we have. Um, so, skipped that, went straight to CPU testing, and for CPU testing, we did use ADA64 to stress the CPU. Um, and we ended up seeing a max T-Dye temp of just under 70 degrees Celsius. Uh, now do keep in mind that some first gen Ryzen chips did have a temperature offset. So basically it would read higher in monitoring software uh, than it actually was. 
uh, but with our SKU we have a regular uh, Ryzen 1700 non-X uh, and it did not have that same uh, temperature offset for the monitoring. Uh, and the reason that they did that offset was to try to mimic Intel's uh, uh, temperature and fan curve more closely. Uh, to be honest, it was a terrible idea and they've moved away from that now, thankfully. Um, but nevertheless, for our chip, uh, it does not matter because we do not have that offset. Um, but again, the, the max temp that we saw was just under 70, which is perfectly fine. Um, we have adequate cooling in this case, so I'm pleased with this result. All right, guys, I appreciate you sticking around until the end of this video. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed making it. Uh, we would love to see you get subscribed if you aren't already. Uh, make sure you hit that like button if you enjoyed this video. And for those of you who have seen my previous content, um, maybe even some of you who have been around uh, since the beginning, let me know what you thought about the video quality compared to the early videos with the Nikon or even some of the more recent videos uh, with the older Lumix G7. Uh, but again, thanks so much. We appreciate you watching, and we will see you in the next one. I like that. Go check it out.